You know, uh, Bob and I were speaking on the phone about the fact that this is coming up on the 30th anniversary of the founding of the party, which was January 1st, 1984. And you know, this theme has always, I've always been asked this, and we always ask ourselves this, you know, how do you gauge success in the political realm? It's easy by, you know, you can count seats if you've won seats, but that's only one measure of success. Right now, of course, we know that um, the theme of this dinner, in fact, as we ha is, is the price of power, you know? And we're on one level talking about the price of electricity. We all know it's skyrocketing right now, thanks to green energy plans and et cetera, brought in by the liberals. And then there's that price of power in the liberal sense that that's, we're paying the price of their political power. But there's a third sense, and that's the sense I wanted to communicate tonight of the price of obtaining power. Because to defend freedom through government, you have to win seats. And that's not a thing you do overnight. In fact, it's not a thing you do in a year or even in 10 years. So how do we gauge our own success? I put together a presentation for you. I hope that by the end of seeing it, you'll agree that uh, we've had some success and that we continue to have success and that we are on path to forming that government that will defend your individual freedom. So without any further ado, well, success is a difficult thing to measure. If you're speaking in terms of getting elected, that, that's a long-term goal. There's the element of political credibility. Um, can you be electable in the immediate future? Well, that's something when we started this party we knew would be at least a decade or two away because uh, credibility in an election is a totally different, it isn't really that related to your ideas directly. It's related more to the credibility of the organization behind the ideas and its consistency and its ability to be there election after election. Mm -hmm. That's basically our function at this point in time is, is to express a different point of view, is to express an alternative to the existing parties. And I'll ask you now to tell us the story of uh, London, Ontario in 1984 when they were vying for the Pan Am Games. Athletes from South, Central and North America show their stuff at the Pan Am Games. London is Canada's official choice as a site for the 1991 Games. And for the boosters, they're a dream come true. Something to put London on the map. But there are others who think that putting London on the map might break the bank. Emery's dreams are based on the philosophy of the Freedom Party. The party helps him deliver his pamphlets. The message here is that governments pillage taxpayers, especially when they use taxes for sports events. It's an extreme view, but Emery thinks 70% of London supports him. City controller Joan Smith agrees that Emery's sewer crusade may be getting through. I'm going door to door 10 times a week, and I'm running consistently into this sense of we don't want the Pan Am Games. The gallery was packed with opponents to the Pan Am Games, and as you can see, people held up signs for hours saying things like, you fix the sidewalks and sewers and let the athletes pay for the games. The bid for the Pan Am Games received its death blow in June of 1985 when Ottawa slapped a five-year freeze on federal sports funding. Well, that's great news, Kathy. I can't we managed to lobby three levels of government and, and uh, halt the spending of 110 million tax dollars on London's hosting the 1991 Pan Am Games. This is a familiar sight in Ontario these days, campaign workers hammering election signs into lawns. But this election sign isn't quite as familiar. It's for the Freedom Party of Ontario, and one of its founding members is Mark Emery, well known for his opposition to London taxpayers supporting the 1991 Pan Am Games. He's the party's campaign director. The party have other candidates outside of the city of London. No, in fact three that's it for London they want to start slowly and win the respect of voters that's how they plan to do it so we might see the Freedom Party of Ontario in next elections I think it was the grips of the 1987 strike by garbage workers at that time in London uh, Freedom Party got out there and said you know what we're going to rent a, a truck and we're going to uh, promote the idea that garbage should be collected privately London's outside city workers are on strike and for many that means leaving the garbage at home Early this morning, the strikers formed picket lines at City Hall and many inside workers turned around refusing to go to work. 
Mark Emery of the Freedom Party held a brief news conference on his plans to collect garbage for lower income people and senior citizens. He expects to do three blocks a day starting Tuesday. Some strikers then confronted him on the issue. I say we don't take it over to your house, New right. City. Well, you won't have why don't you tell us what streets where you're going to pick it up and we'll take the garbage over there. there. Meanwhile, some people in southeast London had their garbage picked up today despite the outside workers' strike. The Freedom Party was providing free garbage pickup as a protest against the garbage strike. This is what we thought of as a, mo a constructive protest. It's a way of saying, well, listen, we don't feel that we should be blackmailed either by the city or by the union or by anybody about essential services. The service costs Emory and the Freedom Party $60 for the truck each day and $100 to empty a full truck at a landfill site outside the city. But Emory says the cost is worth it in order to make a point. Scott Burton, TV London News. While other parties were saying, Let's go bigger with the state. We were saying, let's go bigger with competition. While collecting garbage during a strike may have been popular with some, the Freedom Party's stand in favor of Sunday shopping tends to be unpopular with many. Hello. Here's a brochure supporting your right to shop on Sunday. No, and don't strike it at all. It's bad. Well, what are you buying things for? The London-based Freedom Party held court in a Toronto meeting looking for support. They invited Paul Madger the one-man crusade for Sunday shopping to their meeting. The issue has attracted the son of Sunday shopping advocate Paul Magder to run as a Freedom Party candidate. A pro-freedom platform means they're against censorship laws, against Sunday closing laws, and against most labor legislation, but emphatically for free trade. Obviously not a quick ticket to Queen's Park. We don't even think of, of uh our chances of getting elected as being a viable alternative in this particular election. Our whole campaign is geared to get support from people. Eleven candidates ran across the province last time around. And you've got five great reasons to support freedom of choice and Sunday shopping, and five great reasons to support Freedom Party. In your opinion, why do you think the government is dragging its heels on this matter? Well, the government's not dragging its heels on the matter. The government's causing the problem in the first place. Yes, what is your question, please? I'd like to know where the candidates stand on the issue of Sunday shopping. For the Freedom Party. Yes, we fundamentally support freedom of choice in Sunday shopping. The government will make up its mind on Sunday shopping before the beginning of the summer. That's less than a month away. On June 3, 1992, Ontario's Premier Bob Ray, who had campaigned in 1990 on imposing a tougher ban on Sunday shopping, announced that he was repealing the Sunday shopping ban altogether. By June of 1992, 68% of people in Ontario were in favor of Sunday shopping. Ray explained that he had to recognize the fact that the culture, opinions and attitudes of the populace had changed. The way in which kids are being taught to read and write at issue was so-called whole language instruction and many of the speakers expressed frustration that their children aren't learning the skills they need. To be quite frank, the parent still does not know what this says and the child could not read it back to the parent. Concerns over that kind of spelling and worries about reading skills resulted in a packed gallery for the meeting of the board's program standing committee. And I think if there's any message here tonight that I'd like to bring to, to everyone is let's have some choice in education. And the board insists it's listening. Welcome to Referendum 92. We'll be discussing why vote no on October 26. We will have a further, further uh, spreading of groups apart from each other because this is what the whole Charlottetown proposal does. It identifies us as French Canadians, as Aboriginal Canadians, as White Anglo-Saxon Canadians, in various groups and forms, which to me is not a formula for unifying a country. If anything, that's the very formula that has brought our country to the brink of disintegration. And I think that the question that I'll be asking myself on the 26th is, do I want to live in a country that regards me as one small segment of a larger group, or do I want to live in a country that regards me as a unique individual, along with all my fellow citizens who are also unique individuals, and who all have equal rights from coast to coast. In these pre-election days, the pro-hemp groups have found an unlikely alliance with one political party. We may not like it, we may think it's disgusting, we may disapprove entirely, but as a society we really don't have any right to do anything about it until someone acts irresponsibly. A board of inquiry into human rights complaints against the landlord Elijah Elioff sat, or, or rather sat today and will resume tomorrow. However, although the board's focus is restricted to complaints of racial discrimination against the landlord, his representative charges that his accusers really have another agenda. 
are the mainly Asian tenants here at the Cheyenne Apartments, the victims of a racist landlord? Or are they just pawns in a coldly calculated campaign to ruin his reputation and run him off? Language and cultural barriers make it hard for an outsider to find out for sure what most of the tenants think. Although one of them, Chip Hang Hom, has left no doubt about her position. Three years ago, she filed complaints with the Ontario Human Rights Commission, charging that her landlord had discriminated against her on the basis of race. And the Reverend Susan Eagle has been intimately involved in what she regards as a case of harassment and racial discrimination. Not so, says the Freedom Party's Robert Metz, who's representing Elioff, and who charges he's being targeted by a lobby group who want him out of business. And they've been putting pressure on Mr. Elioff, first of all, to try and sell his buildings at a price that, that they want, and second of all, perhaps to take over the buildings so that they can force the sale of them and make public housing out of You're the saying targets. that this isn't an issue of racism? Uh, not the real issue, no. This is a, a, a false issue created to hide the real issue. Allegations that have generated a blizzard of paper so far, including newspaper articles. Greg Van Morsel and his city editor, Mary Nesbitt, reluctantly showed up with his notes for stories published in November of 89. After going over them with the commission's lawyer, he was cross-examined by Elioff's representative, Robert Metz. Why, asked Metz, did he directly quote Elioff as comparing certain behaviors to that of little pigs, but didn't quote him after what Van Moorsel testified was his follow-up question. There were never any racist comments attributed in quotation marks to Mr. Elioff. All the racial references were made, paraphrased by the author himself. Uh, it was Mr. Van Moorsel who in his articles consistently said, referred to Mr. A uh, Mr. Elioff's tenants as mainly Asian tenants. Van Moorsel's boss stands by his reporting and the paper's impartiality. Meanwhile, the clash of opinions as to the fairness of this entire hearing continues with Metz charging in media releases like this one, that it's part of a smear campaign to paint Elioff as a greedy, racist slumlord, and counsel for the commission questioning Metz as to his motives as a member of the Freedom Party. The Human Rights Tribunal dismissed charges of racial discrimination against then-landlord Elijah Elioff. To the provincial election now. The Freedom Party's fundraising dinner in London tonight drew its biggest turnout since the party was formed a dozen years ago. The party leader and London firefighter Jack Plant addressed supporters and the 12 candidates the party is fielding in this provincial election. Freedom Party has stated from the outset the purpose of government is to protect our freedom of choice, not to restrict it. And it's there to allow us to be free to make our own choices, to accept responsibility for them. But it is there to protect us from other people violating our rights. Tomorrow night on Jim Chapman Live, Paul McKeever will be with us too, the new leader of Freedom Party of Ontario, a party that tells us they're going to make their mark in the next couple of elections in this province. Freedom Party has traditionally been, as my good friend Mr. Metz and I have discussed many times, has been sort of a philosophical gadfly on the, on the Ontario political scene. Uh, you have a new, maybe not a new vision, but you have a sort of a renewed vision for Freedom Party to become more of an active party this time around. Why do you think there's room to do that when perhaps there wasn't in the past? All of the fears of the PCs are coming true. There has been a shift. The common sense revolution has been abandoned. You either get liberal red or liberal blue now. Our, our policies now are addressing mainstream concerns in a mainstream way and avoiding the technical, the philosophical. Mm -hmm. You have to have a plan. We've got a plan. The plan is give parents some choice in education. Give people who are waiting for that MRI a chance not to have to wait a year. Give people a sustainable system of electricity. Ernie Eves is desperately looking for a platform, as far as I can tell. The Liberals are out there selling theirs, so is the NDP, and so is the Freedom Party of Ontario. They believe the time has come for them to make their move from a fringe party to a major player in Ontario politics. We are, we are reaching a point now where socialism it cannot, it's not, it's not financially feasible anymore. And uh, unless people like Freedom Party stand up and tell the public right now that it's time to get our heads out of the sand and make the difficult decisions now, then five years from now it's only going to be much worse. We're going to be there five years from now again. We're laying the groundwork now. We're the only party proposing capitalism as a solution. And uh, people like to believe the Tories are proposing capitalism. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at the, the at NDP, the Liberals and the Tories, their only solution is more public ownership of health care, more public ownership of schools, public ownership, public ownership, public ownership, which can only mean tax, tax, tax to fund them. Uh, that's not capitalism. 
that socialism as much as they want to wrap it up in a capitalist uh, robe. Well, it, can you sell your message if it turns out that a majority of Ontarians are socialists at heart? Well, uh, the thing about socialism is it tends to implode. So uh, just as it imploded in the Soviet Union, and we, thought we saw the uh, economic implosion there and the fall of the, uh, the wall, the Berlin mm -hmm. Wall, we will see the same thing happening in health care. In fact, we're already seeing it. There is no money there to fund a socialist health care system. We're, we're up to our eyes in debt. There's no more room for wiggling. And this is just the last gasping breath in Canada of what we saw in a, a more radicalized socialism in, in the Soviet Union. Well, a lot of people would listen to you say that, though, Paul, and say that maybe you're overstating the case a little bit, that we don't see the signs of crumbling that we saw there, that we've got, right. uh, we have a healthy GDP or, or, or gross provincial product, if you will, that uh, economically Ontario is still fairly sound, that yes, we're heavily taxed, but we get a lot back for our tax dollars. A lot of it may be wasted, but we still, we, we get a lot of value. I mean, a lot of people look at the situation and believe that. Yeah. How, how, how are you going to convince them? This is what fascinates me about your party. You guys yeah. are all so confident that you can get this message across. How are you going to convince people of this? Well, luckily, the economy is on our side. You can't fool the economy, and the economy will simply implode, at which point we'll be proven right anyway. But in the short term, I can tell you as an employment lawyer, that we are very quickly, uh, because of the low dollar, finding most of our significant factories and et cetera being bought out, uh, really we're being turned into more of a branch plan economy. The reason that we have this perception that we're successful is because the Americans need to have cheap labor. Uh, we think we're being paid the same amount, but that's only because our dollar is worth 60% of what the American dollar is worth. We're actually uh, uh, cheap labor. And uh, un when we cease to uh, be uh, palatable, place in which to set up uh, plants, and we're seeing that more and more, uh, the Americans will pull out and then we'll realize just how poor we are. But we are, we are successful in Ontario despite our socialism, not because of it. And uh, more, more rules, I mean, if you look at the liberal, the liberal uh, handbook there, you'll find the word ban in there or regulate uh, more than you'll see anything along the lines of allow or permit. Uh, there are two ways in which to make people do something. You can either give them sugar or you can give them a, a crack across the head with a, with a whip. Uh, Freedom Party essentially says, let people make a profit. Give them a reason to do something productive for society, and they'll do it. We have uh, a Tory party that is basically on the verge of collapse, just as the federal party was. I think you're going to see, the, the, uh, at the provincial level, the same thing that happened at the federal level. There's going to be a realignment. Uh, the Tory party will split. It will cease to be significant in Ontario. I, I'll put you at about 10 years from today, you will see a provincial Tory party that is no more powerful than the federal Tory today. Up next, the Freedom Party, a new player in Ontario politics. It's week two of the Ontario election campaign. Voters have been getting an earful from the PCs, Liberals and NDP, but they're not the only parties in the race. During the course of the campaign, Studio Two will feature the parties running a significant number of candidates, and tonight that means the Freedom Party. With us tonight, Paul McKeever. He's the leader of the Freedom Party of Ontario. Nice of you to join us tonight. Thank you, Steve. you got, what, 30 candidates or so running? Tell me what the main principles are that you hold that you think the three other parties don't hold and therefore you're so distinctive. Uh, we simply believe that the market works. So competition works. Uh, competition between companies is always the best way to improve the quality of any service. Period, full stop? Period, full stop. The Freedom Party says it is the only party that is offering a program that will make Ontario a better place. CFTO's Mutet Nebrez takes a look at the party's platform. We're going to be looking at, you know, uh, Dalton Eves or Ernie McGinty. They really are the same fellow when it comes to policy. The differences are minuscule compared to what Freedom Party is offering the public. We believe that markets work and that uh, really we need more competition in health care, uh, in schooling, in electricity, in auto insurance, not less. You know, a few weeks ago, there was a lot of uh, talk in the media about a new website, uh, YouTube, and there were a few other video sharing um, websites that were being discussed. And folks around the Freedom Party uh, executive table said, you know, what a great opportunity this might be to reach out, speak with other Ontarians, find out what's uh, on their mind, and maybe let them have a little bit better look at uh, who Paul McKeever is and uh, who Freedom Party is and what they're all about. I mean, we have the most popular videos on YouTube, four times more popular than the progressives, conservatives, and the liberals. Four times. We don't have advertising budgets. We're just there. And people come to us because they like what we say, not because they know who we are. They may like what you say, but they're not voting for you. That's only because uh, they, the, the number one factor in voting so far has been, well, 
you know, I just want to push out the guy who's in there, and to do that, I'm going to use the party that's the second biggest. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the sort of hammerhead uh, approach to voting. We don't ascribe to that, and we know uh, that most Ontarians, if given the opportunity to see that somebody represents other views than the ones they see in the Liberal and Conservative camps, uh, will start saying, you know what, uh, it's time for revolution. Uh, the Conservatives are making themselves rather redundant, and I think when they fall, that's when a new party emerges, and we're making sure that we're ready for that time. There is no other party like Freedom Party in Ontario right now promoting lower taxes uh, and a better life. There's no one uttering the word private sector competition except Freedom Party. Do you know why? Yes. The ghost of Mike Harris. And as soon as everybody gets over that, and that's coming soon, because you know socialism can only work itself into a hole, uh, people will be saying, you know what, it's time to do what we did in 95. It's time to look for a tax-cutting party rather than one that's promising us more freebies. Okay, tell me this. As you consider the kind of strategic future of yeah. your party, most parties in opposition focus on the government. The mm -hmm. government is the enemy, if you like. Right. Are the liberals the enemy as far as you're concerned? I would, I would assume that, that ideologically you are most closely aligned with the progressive conservative party Absolutely of Ontario. Not. And you say no. No. Well, people would assume that because you're both kind of center-right party, right-wing parties is the assumption. That's a, that's a flawed assumption in the sense that it, historically it was the progressive conservatives that gave us socialized health care, the ban on private um, insurance, the rent controls, the Human Rights Commission, the, um, uh, the retail sales tax, which is now the HST. Virtually every major shift into socialism has been due to the progressive conservative party. The liberal party has been more... Um, twiddling the small knobs after the big damage is done by the progressive conservatives. But that's not the real reason why in this election we're targeting them. Uh, it, that is certainly one reason. They're, they're a force for, they're a destructive force as far as I'm concerned on the economy, the progressive conservatives. They're backward. They, in my view, are dishonest with the public. Either we stand up today or we all pay tomorrow. We will fight this tax tooth and nail. Together we'll stop this greedy tax grab dead in its tracks and help our province move forward together. Thank you very much. Would a Premier Hudak then repeal the HST? Well, I mean, listen, uh, you know, our first chance to bring forward uh, uh, a budget would be uh, in, uh, in spring of 2012. I, I just need a yes or no. Would a Premier Hudak repeal the HST? No, listen, I, I, I can guarantee you taxes will be lower. Green Energy uh, Act, you voted against it, constantly critical of the way of the impact it's had on the economy and on energy prices. Would you repeal it? You know, the PC support renewable energy, but it has to be affordable for the families who pay the bill. So amend rather than repeal, is well, that what you're talking about? You know, we'll, we'll see what's in the act worth keeping. We will close down the coal plants by 2014. Wind and solar should complement the system. They never actually say what they're really interested in doing. They tell the people about, well, we're here for seniors and we're here for middle okay, class, so hardworking. Why are you targeting them? We're targeting them because, unfortunately, in a society where people don't have a lot of time to study issues or even the inclination to do so, they will say, am I sick of the party that's in power? If so, I'll pick the next biggest one, provided that the next biggest one is not every bit as toxic as the one I'm trying to get rid of. So to be sucked into power is the only way to assume power after some other party has left. That's the overwhelming um, force in electoral change, in, in party change. So you have to be number two. To take out number two, in this case, is to expose the progressive conservatives as the worse than liberals that they are. Ontario's liberals and progressive conservatives believe that the top priority for Ontario's electricity system is fighting climate change. Dalton McGuinty's liberals want to fight climate change by forcing you to pay hugely inflated prices for wind and solar power. Tim Hudak's progressive conservatives want to fight climate change by forcing you to pay tens of billions of dollars for new nuclear power generators. We haven't even paid for the old ones yet. I'm Paul McKeever and I won't spend your money trying to prevent natural climate change. A freedom government will make price top priority. There's three things that our planks need to do to get those passions going, to get people interested in supporting us and thinking, hey, to replace the liberal guy, I'm going to pick the Freedom Party guy. The planks have to be understandable. People don't understand the intricacies of nuclear versus wind versus solar. But tell the guy that I'm going to knock five bucks off a case of beer, he understands that. On Canada Day, 2010, the Liberal government of Dalton McGuinty quietly introduced the BST, a tax only on beers brewed in Ontario. There's no BST on imported beer. A freedom government will eliminate the BST. That will knock as much as $5.76 off the price of a case of the many fine beers brewed right here in Ontario. 
Freedom Party. No BS. T. They got nice guitar yeah, players who, there at the Freedom Party. That? Nice little uh, riff there. Who was that playing? I next? don't know. Uh, is that Slash? The <laughs> Slash. <laughs> Harry Chapin? No, yeah, uh, it's no. not him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the BST, I like it. Yeah. Beer sales tax or bullshit yeah, tax. Yeah, that's right. The proposed change has to be relevant to the person. Make sure you have enough of those small, easily identified, easily understandable planks that some of them are of interest to some to different groups. Like a butterfly, like a bee. Ontario's public schools should not tell children that this man is among the greatest black athletes in history. They should tell children that this man is among the greatest athletes in history. A freedom government will eliminate race-focused public schools. I am the greatest. One race, the human race, Freedom Party. Right now we're talking about the Freedom Party of Ontario, who are always well-spoken, who always have great ideas through their uh, leadership in Paul McKeever. John, go ahead. Hello, how are you doing? Good, John. Yeah, I just heard that Paul McKeever fellow, and I mean, he's talking some serious common sense there, and it's a breath of fresh air to hear a politician be talking like that. If Jim Hudak picks up this message, and runs on it, he's an ex-premier. Well, it's up to the Freedom Party right now because it's their message they're trying to put out. And finally, they have to be planks that they believe could actually be accomplished, things that they think the government could actually do if they just stood up the plate and did them. Ontario's gasoline tax was introduced by the Conservatives in 1925. Last year, Dalton McGuinty started charging HST on gasoline. He even taxed the tax. Two taxes is too much. A freedom government will eliminate the old gasoline tax. That will reduce the price of gasoline by 16.6 .6 cents per litre. Fill her up with Freedom Party. Price of gas up again. Where is all this going? We'll talk to uh, the Freedom Party of Ontario where they would like to see uh, Adult McGinty scrap part of uh, the taxes that we're now charging on gasoline because we're now paying taxes on taxes. Makes no sense at all. Uh, you're running a lot of candidates in the Ontario election? Yes, indeed. We're running enough to uh, form the next government of Ontario. All right. I want to bring up another issue, uh, one that has to do with the pocketbook and the stomach. Right. Uh, I think we've got another ad ready. This one on beer and wine in corner stores. Here it is. You're at the 24-hour grocery store. Your friends are coming over for dinner in a few minutes, but you have no wine or beer to offer them check your watch. The liquor store and the beer store are both closed. With a freedom government, this will never happen again. If you are an adult, you'll be able to buy wine and beer in the grocery store or in a convenience store 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Convenience from Freedom Party. In other parts of the country, this is a no-brainer. In Alberta, in, in, in Quebec, I'm not sure about B.C. I think they have a mixed system there as well. Why, why are we stuck with what we've got in Ontario? You know what? Paul McKeever, who's the leader of the Freedom Party, yeah. will be able to tell his grandchildren someday, I beat Dalton McGuinty <laughs> as the sexiest candidate. That's right, but, he can. But not necessarily on the ballot where it counts. That's true. Let's talk about the financial situation you were on this week about the, the state of the deficits. So one presumes you're going to come up with a deficit reduction plan, still to be seen, but you got, you're talking about $18.7 billion from where we stand now. So surely you're going to have to do something on the big ticket items. It has to be something to do with reading and health care costs, dealing with education, dealing with social services. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's a big hole. So we'll set priorities, health and education. We'll invest more in those areas. It's the right thing to do. Health care, education, and interest on the debt consumes 100% of Ontario's provincial tax revenues. Justice and welfare consumes almost 83% of the money Ontario receives from the federal government. Ontario currently borrows about $15.3 billion per year to pay for everything else the Ontario government does. Liberal leader Dalton McGuinty and progressive conservative leader Tim Hudak say they will balance the budget by 2017-2018 without cutting health care or education, and they can't stop making interest payments on Ontario's debt. It is also doubtful that they would promise to reduce welfare or justice. So what would they have to cut to balance the budget? If the Liberals and Conservatives will not cut health care, education, welfare or justice, 
they would have to cut the budgets of all other government ministries by 80%, or they would have to entirely shut down and eliminate 16 of those 20 ministries. But we all know they have no intention of shutting down 80% of the government's remaining ministries. No, folks. The fact is, when it comes to balancing the budget, neither Dalton McGinty's Liberals nor Tim Hudak's Conservatives have any plan at all. The Freedom Party does have a plan. Freedom Party's 2012 opposition budget explains how Ontario can balance the budget while significantly lowering taxes and improving health care in the province. Get it now at freedomparty.on.ca slash budget. Paul, I, I've looked at the document. It's fantastic. It's common sense, which might mean it won't go anywhere with the sitting government. But um, like you said, something has to be done. And thank you for sharing your thoughts. Paul McKeever, I have to tell you, uh, the, the Freedom Party of Ontario and this man, some of the most sensible staff I've ever heard. Uh, and I say this as someone who has trouble voting for any particular party, but uh, really, a lot of common sense and objective analysis of what is going on. He's a politician and a lawyer, and uh, always great fun to have here. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, Michael. How are and you? And a man with the finest beard in Canadian politics. <laughs> All right, now, the first shot has been taken in uh, terms of a political attack ad in this particular campaign, and it's not coming from the PCs, it's not coming from the NDP, it's coming from the Freedom Party in London West. The candidate there, his name is Al Gretzky, he is Wayne's uncle, again running for the Freedom Party in London West. They released an ad you'll only hear on radio stations in London. Here's what it sounds like. It seems like every day, Kathleen Wynne's Liberals are apologizing for something they've done to you. And I am very sorry. I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry for that. The people of Ontario need to hear that I'm sorry because I am. I am sorry. Spending scandals, cover-ups, tax increases, rising electricity bills, health care delays. And it's important not just for this issue, it's important going forward. So I'm sorry about this. What will Kathleen Wynne's Liberals be sorry for tomorrow? Don't wait to find out. In the coming provincial by-election, elect Al Gretzky to be your MPP in London West. My name is Al Gretzky, and I am your Freedom Party candidate in the provincial by-election in London West. Elect Al Gretzky, because voting for Al Gretzky means never having to hear And I am very sorry. I'm sorry. That's what I'm, uh, I'm able to offer. This message has been paid for by the Freedom Party of Ontario. I like that. Voting for Al Gretzky means never having to say you're sorry. That's sweet. Meanwhile, the Conservative candidate for the riding of London West has been accused of having some former Liberal ties. This picture of Ali Shabar sporting a Liberal Party pin has recently resurfaced, and that has him defending himself from accusations that he's a closet Liberal. Here's Shabar earlier today while campaigning with Tory leader Tim Hudak. I think the voters in London West really care about this type of stuff. They're concerned about jobs, concerned about the unemployment rate being 9.9 percent. They're concerned about who has a better plan. I don't think they're really preoccupied with this, you know, who was where, when, you know, or what happened three, four years ago. Meanwhile, it's the Freedom Party and not the better funded mainstream parties that have been quickest off the mark taking it to their opponents in the early going in London West. The Freedom Party was out first with that radio ad we played here last night that hammered Liberal Premier Kathleen Wynne and they were quick to pass around that 2009 picture of Ali Shabar hanging out with the Liberals. London West. Uh, it is a bit more of a toss-up, perhaps, than, than people expected at the beginning when Wynne called the by-election there. And there are some unconventional parties that are making some waves there, like the Freedom Party. What, do you, what are you seeing? This is very interesting to me. The Freedom Party's candidate is Al Gretzky. He's related to Wayne Gretzky. He's known in the neighborhood. And they're doing a good job these days of actually articulating their vision, coming out with policy papers, coming out with regular press releases, coming out with video ads that they can send directly to, uh, directly to the voters, YouTube videos and links. Something that they have organization, which usually fringe parties, they're called fringe for a reason. They're jokey, they're hokey pokey. They don't have their act together. Freedom Party beginning to have their act together. I've been warning you that we'll be giving you updates on the by-elections across Ontario. Why? Because I think it's time to kick the McGinty win Liberals to the curb, and this is an example of how it can be done. Today, Al Gretzky. And why am I profiling Al Gretzky? Some of you will be saying, where's the PC candidate? Well, the PC candidate is actually a big Liberal supporter who in the last federal election was out supporting 
Doug Ferguson, the Liberal candidate in London West, the PC candidate is a Liberal, and Al Gretzky is with me in studio. I ran federally with the Conservative Party. And so you did quite well. You almost, yep. I think we, we've got the 000. numbers, you almost defeated Sue Barnes. Sue Barnes. So uh, when uh, I'm looking around at the candidates that are running in the provincial election, or by-election this time around, I thought to myself, what we have here is liberal left, NDP left, and conservative almost left. Tell us what Freedom Party is, what Freedom Party stands for. Basically speaking, uh, Freedom Party, we believe in fiscal responsibility. The biggest one we care about, of course, is the debt. The debt that is taking us down that rabbit hole. It is just absolutely crazy. And if we don't do something about it soon, then then we're going to lose. Make yourself statistically significant. Get up over that 3% margin of error and the pollsters will have a reason to include you. They'll want to know. The, ver the veracity of their data depends on it. And when you get included, when you see yourself, trust me, when you see PC, Liberal, NDP, Green, Freedom Party, on the CTV News, the CBC News, Global, there's gonna be this little spark of hope, but you know it, it's the one that's missing right now. You know that little thing, oh, is it all worth it? Why am I here tonight? Maybe I should have done something else. Paul, I want to show you some numbers that I'm sure you're well aware of. Sure. Michael, if we can, let's bring these up and you can look at the monitor over my shoulder here. In the last uh, five elections in the province of Ontario, I don't think the Freedom Party has managed to hit more than 0.2% of the total votes cast. Right. And in 2003, actually it's your highest total in, in the last five elections, but still, in a province of 13 million people, we're talking about fewer than 10,000 votes. Uh, the question is, why do this? You're obviously not going to win any seats. You're not going to be the next Premier of Ontario. Mm -hmm. Why do this? Some of you, this little part of you, wonders if maybe there's no hope. Well, there are, there's always hope. Trust me. Back to the Ontario by-elections now, where the small but plucky Freedom Party is hoping to at least raise its profile. Their strongest support seems to be in London West, where a campaign research poll found candidate Al Gretzky has the support of 7% of voters, which is higher than many might expect for a lesser-known political party. Paul, how long have you been the leader of the party? Uh, since 2002. Okay, so you're coming up on almost a decade of doing this, and yes. what's the most number of votes any of your candidates has ever got in an election? Vote count, I, I don't recall. 1.6 percent, 1.8. Uh, could, we could have cracked, cracked 2 percent or something like that um, in one riding at one point. So tell me, are, are, do you ever get tired of constantly fighting the good fight and yet on election day having very little to show for it? Never. Joining us now, a name I recognize, Paul McKeever, leader of the Freedom Party. Morning, Andy. Good morning, Paul. How are you? The sun is shining on Freedom Party in London West today, Andy. Really? Oh, I've got to tell you, I've broken down the data. You have Freedom Party gained 743%. That's the percentage of increase over the 2011 election. 743% increase. Followed by the NDP, they grew 92.6%. The Greens grew 81.5%. And the PCs only grew 14.2%. Meanwhile, the Liberals lost 64.3% of their vote. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, we've, we're like a projectile flying, flying through the air. I can't wait for the next general election, and I'm proud as punch. Uh, both of our, our candidate, Al Gretzky, and of all of the good Londoners who said, you know what, I don't care about the color of a sign. I'm going to stand up for the guy with the integrity and the honesty, and they did it. And 5.1% is a historic high for Freedom Party in the riding and across the province, and I'm really encouraged for the next election. I really enjoyed that video because it shows Paul and it shows Bob and Barry Malcolm and a lot of us folks growing old. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, glasses styles have changed a lot in the in 30 years. <laughs> and so has facial hair and chubby cheeks have gone. But I always get a kick out of watching that stuff. Well produced, Paul. Paul McKeever did all of that by himself. He's an amazing documentary and videographer. And um, I think that what was referred to there is all of the success on YouTube, that new internet channel, YouTube, um, is 90% uh, due to the efforts of Paul McKeever. He's uh, not just the leader of the party philosophically, uh, morally, uh, motivationally, but he's also behind the scenes um, working on videos, working on production like that to get our name out there. So well done, Paul.